and welcome to GameSec. I figured today would be a good time as any to look at East 9 Monstrum Knox. Now, if you've seen two or 300 episodes of GameSec, you probably know I'm a huge fan of the East action RPG series. And I've got to admit that when I first saw the screens of this one, I was a little bit nervous. So, how does it hold up? I'm glad you asked. Let's get right into it. East 9, Monstrum Nox from Falcom was released in the last part of 2019 in Japan, but didn't get released anywhere else until the beginning of 2021. It's on the PlayStation 4, PC, Switch, and even the freaking Stadia. I played the PlayStation 4 version running on a PlayStation 5. More about that later in this review. This game begins after the events of East 7. In case you didn't know, the East timeline doesn't take place in the same order as the games. But as of this review, this is the latest game in the timeline with no current games taking place after the events here. So do you need to be familiar with any of the previous games to enjoy this one? No, absolutely not. Every East game is a self-contained adventure that can be enjoyed as a standalone game, though there are plenty of references to the past adventures. This game even has kind of a self-deprecating sense of humor about it sometimes. It seems that shipwrecks are a common occurrence for you. Even sailors and fishermen don't experience a fraction of the accidents you've been in. When the first trailers for this game came out a few years ago, I have to admit that I wasn't really impressed, to be honest. After the incredible expanding adventure that East 8 was, this one seemed to be more reserved and potentially boring. Of course I bought it anyway, because I'll buy any game in the East series. After watching that initial trailer, I didn't watch any subsequent trailers, nor did I play any demos. So, did the game end up being better than I had anticipated? Yes, very, very much so. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. You are Adol, and yes, I will always pronounce his name that way since that's how the original games did it. Plus, Adol just sounds better than Adol. Adol sounds too much like Adderall, so Adol it is. Of course, that kind of sounds like Adolf. You start out the game escaping from the prison that you're being held in for some reason. On your way out, you meet Aprilis, who curses you to become a Monstrum. As a Monstrum, you have a special gift which allows you to make a beeline to any one of these red things by pressing the R2 button. You soon learn that, as a Monstrum, you're forced to fight inside the Grimwald Nox, which is full of creatures that are absolutely in love with the purple, black, turquoise, and white color scheme. There are also five other Monstrums who fight with you in the Grimwald Nox. Once the Grimwald Nox is cleared, then you all turn back into regular people. Throughout your adventure, you'll discover which people are your fellow Monstrums, and usually it's pretty obvious, but of course everyone in the game acts hella surprised. Yes, I said hella. You spend much of your time exploring the extremely large city of Balduk, which was built around the rather large prison that you escaped from. I mean, the city is big for a video game, but it doesn't have anything on real cities like Denver or Shanghai or Chicago or anything like that. Unfortunately, as a Monstrum, you're cursed and you can't leave the city ever again. You can't even go to many other parts of the city at first. Your main goal is basically learning the secret of the prison as well as that of the Grimwald Knox. The game is composed of nine chapters, and most of them begin with you randomly running around town needing to fight Lemuries, which are the Grimwald monsters. You do this right in the town itself. You encounter these black orbs, and when you touch one, the monsters appear and you fight them. Time freezes for the town, so everyone else is completely unaware that anything is happening at all. Once you defeat a group of monsters, either three or five Nox points are added to a gauge in the upper left corner of the screen. That's right, the game forces you to grind in this manner. Once you get 100 Nox points, a big evil orb appears somewhere in the city. Run to it, and then you fight a big battle inside the Grimwald Nox. These battles are kind of a letdown, though. In East 8, they added a tower defense aspect to the gameplay, and they really took that concept and ran with it here. I don't know why Falcom thinks that everyone wants a tower defense system in their East games. Basically, there's a giant crystal in the middle of the stage for whatever reason. The monsters inside the Grimwald Nox want nothing more in their lives than to destroy this crystal, and you must defend it against waves and waves of enemies. It is absolutely chaotic, and that is putting it kindly. Oh, 
before the battles, you can enhance and upgrade the crystal or other things to distract the enemies inside the Nox. These Grimwald Nox battles really feel like more of a chore and are the low point of the game for sure. What concerns me is that this is the second game that Falcom has put this crap in. Just like the three-party system, I fear that they just might continue to do this with all future games in the series because someone who works for them likes it so much. I really hope that this isn't going to be the case. There are some Nox battles though where you only need to break all of the magenta crystals in each area before the time runs out. You can pretty much ignore the monsters here, but they will bum rush you in order to keep those crystals intact. Hmm, kind of like reversing the roles I guess. The bosses of these areas are invulnerable as well. I like these Nox experiences much more as trying to find all of the crystals is actually kind of fun. Once you win a Nox battle, a barrier is removed and you're allowed to explore beyond that point, thus progressing the story. Speaking of the story, it's generally pretty good here. Granted, it's often fairly predictable, but enjoyable nonetheless. There was one point in the latter part of the game where I felt the story was going to take a nosedive, but fortunately that didn't happen and I can say that I found the overall story rather satisfying. At some points in the game, you're playing another Adol? This is where the mystery starts getting pretty good as you explore the inside of the prison. I really enjoyed these segments. The only bad thing is that just when it starts to get good, you switch back to playing the other Adol. There are a few things though, especially in the final chapter, that feel a bit tacked on in order to add a bit of length. And by a bit, I mean three minutes of dialogue and a two minute battle. Oh well. Speaking of dialogue, the characters are, once again, very, very wordy. I often get bored with so much dialogue as everything seems purposely padded out in order to use as many words as possible to say even the simplest thing. I guess I just prefer my dialogue to be more efficient. Should have just said so from the start. For this reason, I kind of avoided talking to the characters unless I really needed to. Maybe I need to take some Adderall. There are bunches of side quests in the game, and some of them will be required, so if you haven't done them by the time the final chapter rolls around, well, then you'll have to do them there. There are also other things that you can do, like collect blue flower petals that are scattered all over the city, or look at graffiti. You can give the blue petals away and report the graffiti to earn some cool items. Basically, there's a ton of stuff to do in East 9, but you're certainly not forced to do everything. Most of it is extremely enjoyable. The good news is that you don't have to spend the entire game in the city. There are plenty of large dungeons to explore. You also get to leave the city, and the area outside is huge with lots and lots to explore. It perhaps takes the game a bit too long to be able to leave the city, but it's quite a fresh of breath air once you do. The gameplay is pretty tight, and I mean that literally and figuratively. Yeah, that gameplay is tight, yo! If you've had a chance to play East 8, this plays very much the same with plenty of additions and enhancements. You still have the three-party system which has been in place since East 7. Keep in mind, however, that East 7 was released in 2010, so many East games since then have used this. Basically, each character has a select type of monster that they're best at defeating. Some characters are best at fleshy and squishy things, Others are good for armored or tough things, and the rest are good at airborne things. You'll eventually have six total characters in your party and three active members. You can switch between the three active members anytime you're playing with the tap of the circle button. This game doesn't seem to penalize you as much for using the wrong type of character for each enemy as previous games did, and that's definitely a great thing. For the most part, I just used Adol, and I only switched to another character when his health got low. Speaking of which, the other two characters will fight beside you and you can even tell them to be offensive or defensive. Either way, it's unlikely that they'll be damaged very much during most battles, so just put them on offense and make them do more work for you. Each monstrum has a unique gift or power that will allow you to explore more of the city. For example, White Cat can run straight up walls, or Hawk can glide during a jump. Most of the dungeons will require the talents of each monstrum to get by certain obstacles. So that probably means you'll be switching back and forth between the characters a lot, right? Actually no, thank god. Once another monstrum joins your party, every character can use their powers. Even if that character leaves your party for a while, you can still use every power you could before. I'm glad that they made this choice as this immensely improves the game. Another thing I really like is the mapping as you explore. A yellow line remains behind you to show where you've recently been. Yeah, Ease 8 did this as well, but I feel they improved on it a lot here. For one, the line lasts a lot longer. The action is quite fast, and you can't beat the hack and slash feel. 
Exploring is super fun as well, especially once you have all of the Monstrum's power to help you get almost anywhere you can see, and plenty of places you can't. I even enjoy the menu system as it's extremely easy to work with and deal with your items and equipment. Who gives a crap? Alright, so now we've taken a look at how the game actually plays, so let's talk about the elephant in the room, the graphics, and the rest of the presentation. If you can remember back to the beginning of this episode where I said that I'm playing the PlayStation 4 version on a PS5, congratulate yourself. You have an amazing memory and you deserve an ice cream cone as a reward. I haven't tried playing this game on a PS4 or PS4 Pro. I've read that the game runs at 30 frames per second on a PS4 Amateur and a little bit better on a PS4 Pro. The game runs at a constant 60 frames per second here on the PS5. There may be some drops here and there, but I haven't noticed many, if any. You can play this in HDR on a PS5 as well, though the game does not natively take advantage of HDR. It's instead tone mapped by the console. All of the footage I recorded of me playing here was before the PS5 firmware was updated to allow toggling of HDR for non-HDR games. So that's why this episode is presented in 4K HDR 60 frames per second. If you want to see what the tone mapped HDR in this game looks like, well, watch this episode on an HDR display. Either way, you're going to get some bold and bright colors, though the city itself is largely a monotone light gray. As far as the rest of the graphic quality goes, it honestly looks like a PlayStation 3 game, maybe even a touch worse in some areas. There are jaggies everywhere, and I think that the game has an internal resolution less than 720p sometimes. Things pop in and out of existence, and overall it really looks quite dated, even for 2019 when this originally came out in Japan. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's almost embarrassing. If you've ever played East 8, then you know that that game looked just as good, if not better, than this one does, even on a base PS4 where it ran at 60 frames per second. So what happened? I've read that Falcom made a new custom engine for this game, and maybe this is the cause. At the same time, I've also read that Falcom's new engine will be in the next East game, so I'm not sure what to believe. I'm sure someone will leave a comment below saying one way or the other. Regardless, it's a step back from East 8 on the base PS4, or even the PS4 Pro. In fact, I wouldn't recommend playing it on anything else except a PS5. Sadly, those are hard to come by these days. Maybe try the PC version. It's very disappointing that Falcom dropped the ball here. I suppose it's possible that the town is just too detailed for Falcom's existing engine so they capped the frame rate on certain platforms, and also cut the resolution a bit. That being said, you do get used to it, at least on the PS5. The design of the town and the monsters are, of course, low budget, but they're excellent for what they are. The bosses all look great, and each and every one of them are extremely fun to fight. Well, there was one which wasn't hugely enjoyable, but it was fine. The characters all have a unique and pleasant design and are instantly recognizable from across the room. Some of the NPCs look identical, though. I guess there are many, many twins in the city of Balduk. The graphics do improve a little bit as you get further into the game. Like here in these caves, I felt that the textures and everything else here is higher quality than it is in the city. East games are known for having outstanding music, so how's the soundtrack here? Well, it starts out good, but not great. It certainly fits with the game, but nothing is hugely memorable. However, it really does improve tenfold as you get further and further. There are some tunes that kind of remind me of Shenmue as you explore the town, and some dungeons have super energetic melodies. Something's there. All yours, at all. The score overall isn't quite as good as East 8, or East 1, or East 2, or East 3, or East 4, but it's definitely very good overall. Much better than most other games these days. There's a lot of voice work done here as well, with some of the voice actors returning, or at least I assume, as the English voice actors aren't listed in the game's credits. You can enable Japanese voices if you prefer, but I found the English ones fine. Nothing like a little blood sport to keep the unwashed masses happy. In battle, everyone has lots to say, and they all talk over one another, which only adds to the chaos. You can turn the battle voices off in the option screen if you want. 
One final thing to note is that this game is in stereo only. There is absolutely no surround sound at all, anywhere, nor is there any presence of discrete subwoofer. If you have a 5.1, 7.1 or better setup, all of the sound here will only come from your front left and right speakers. I think that surround sound might be a bit beyond Falcom's current skill set. Overall, the audio-visual presentation of this title could be better in many areas, but it didn't detract too much from my overall enjoyment of the game. Okay, I've got to admit that there was a point at the beginning of Chapter 5 where I felt like not playing this game ever again. I was kind of bored with the grind to get 100 Nox points. I felt like this would end up being the only Ease game besides Ease 5 that I never bothered to complete. But after a while, I came back to it once I decided I wanted to review it. Grinding to 100 Nox points will take you about 15 or 20 minutes of running around town, maybe more. After that, you can open up a new area and get to the actual meat of the game. I'm glad that I did come back, but be warned, you may or may not fall victim to the same kind of burnout. Here they come. Give it up. This is a very good game and absolutely worth playing. I like the humor presented here and the acknowledgments of a few of the past games. You've even happened upon legendary weapons and artifacts, but somehow you always lose them afterward. The ending to East 8 left me a tad disappointed, but that's not the case here, fortunately. Yes, the graphics could certainly be a lot better, but it's still a very memorable adventure. Actually, this is probably one of my top East games for me, despite its flaws. I don't like it as much as East 8, but it's up there. Maybe right behind the TurboGrafx CD versions of East 1, 2, and 4. So I guess that would make this my fifth favorite East game? Hey, that's still pretty good. In fact, the singular town in the game reminded me of East 3, which also only had one town. I don't know how many hours it took me to beat the game, as there isn't a timer sadly, at least not one that I know of, but it was way more than enough for me. And like I said, you can greatly expand the time you spend with it if you want to do everything. I'm really looking forward to see what they come up with for the eventual East 10. I hope they can get their graphics team in gear for that release and have it look at least somewhat modern. Also, please, fewer or no more tower defense stuff. I beg you. Regardless, I'll definitely buy it. Overall, I absolutely recommend East 9 Monstrum Knox for sure. Oh, and sorry, no, you can't pet the dog. And there you go, those are my thoughts on East 9 Monstrum Knox. It's a fantastic game that I think everyone should play. If you're new to the series, this is as good a game as any to jump right in, and I think you'll enjoy it. Granted, it's not a AAA game, and you know, sometimes that's a-okay. Just enjoy it for what it is. Anyway, what are your thoughts on East 9 Monstrum Knox if you played it? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. Hey guys, I thought I'd show you the games that I own for the Wise series. In fact, I have quite a few. I have them all except maybe for the ones I don't. Uh, some of my favorites are like Wise Book 1 and 2. Also Wise, which is called Wanderers from Wise. That game is really, really easy. Uh, Wise The Vanished Omens on the Master System. That game is not easy at all. There's also Wise, the Oath in Flegheim. It's kind of easy. Joe, you're crazy. You better answer the phone. How many years has it been? I mean, seriously. Um, there's also Wise, Dan's Lacrimonica, which is... Hold on. Hello, Johnny Millennium. Hey, Joe! Oh, I'm glad you answered the phone. That was very wise of you to do. 
Why do you keep calling it wise, man? It's ease. But it's been ease for the last 30 plus years. You know this by now. What is your major malfunction, dude? Seriously. And you know something? I know you have my copy of Ease 4, The Dawn of Ease. I know it's not on my shelf anymore. I know you took it, and I want it back. I'm telling you this, you better give it back to me, or else I'm going to come over there, I'm going to store you out, say, oh my god, you better Another one I really like is Wise, The Art of Nepotism. 